try to listen as well. And as my mother used to say to me during dinner, try and eat quietly. So see if that works. Um, as you know, I'm Stephen Sacker, and I present a show on the BBC called Hard Talk. Uh, and I tell you that simply because it's rather important for this session to know that I come to this as a journalist who takes um, objective, impartial journalism quite seriously. It's actually what I do and what my organization, the BBC, is committed to. But our debate this evening is going to be about the degree to which truth-telling and honesty are qualities that we see in Ukraine, in Russia, in the reporting of the current conflict and in the telling of stories about the history of this region. To what extent is truth-telling a part of the picture? Let me introduce you to three people who have very interesting views on truth, on propaganda, on the nature of storytelling. So let me invite onto the stage now my three panelists. I'm going to introduce them all and then give them all collectively a very warm welcome. That is Bernard-Henri Lévy, the renowned French philosopher and author and sometimes intrepid reporter. Peter Pomerantsov, who is a journalist and writer who has looked at Russian media from the inside and wrote a remarkable book called Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And finally, from here in Ukraine, Oksana Zabushko, who is one of this country's finest writers, poets, and critics. So please welcome all three of them onto the stage. Thank you. I'm rather hopefully assuming they're all here. Let's see if they are all here. Well, that's no excuse. Bring your food up here. I brought my wine. You can bring your food. Oksana and Peter and Bernard, where, where are you all? Ah, welcome. Welcome, all three of you. Great to see you. Hi, Bernard. Hello, Peter. Hello, Oksana. Thank you, all three of you, for agreeing to uh, sacrifice dinner, or at least part of dinner, <laughs> part of dinner for this. Um, and I'm going to start with a very broad question for all three of you. When you look at both Ukraine and Russia today and the stories that each country tells about the conflict, about right and wrong, and about history, what has happened to the truth? Does the truth play any real part in the storytelling that we see in this region today. And Oksana, I'm going to start with you because you have a vested interest. You live here. Do you have a microphone, by the way? I do. Uh, well, um, I don't know much about Russia. Um, I think I have to start with justifying my presence at this session. Well, don't worry too much about Russia. Let's, let's start by thinking about Ukraine. Uh, uh, well, um, you know, I would rather start with comparing uh, not Russian and Ukrainian or juxtaposing uh, Russian and Ukrainian stories, uh, but with um, uh, Ukrainian and Western stories, because they do have uh, much in common, so to speak, and we are all in the same boat. Um, and that is um, neither the West nor Ukraine has, in fact, a story of its own of what is happening. And uh, I have to confess uh, that I kind of shudder 
every time when I hear from my Western counterparts something about Ukrainian story, Ukrainian narrative, Ukrainian version of this and that, because there is a taciturn assumption uh, behind such statements uh, that Ukraine owns uh, a public space uh, of its own. Uh, for the discussion uh, of the vital matters of uh, national existence and for getting some national consensus, uh, that's a big mistake. Ukraine does not. Uh, and uh, Ukrainian media don't really represent the nation. Uh, we are all subjected uh, to um, the long-lasting effect of the Russian story, uh, which uh, back in my students' years, uh, I'm old enough to remember Soviet times uh, pretty well, uh, was called ideological subversion. And uh, its target has been uh, to create, it's not just about propaganda, it's more than propaganda. It's the um, ambition to create um, in the opponent's society a totally distorted picture of reality where no one, uh, despite uh, the abundance of information, would be able uh, to come to sensible conclusions in the interests of defending oneself and defending your own country and defending uh, your community, your family or whatever. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I guess, uh, you're getting bored. No, I'm not getting bored, but I'm interested when you talk about uh, your memories of living in Ukraine when it was part of the Soviet Union. Are you suggesting to me that, that Ukraine is somehow still dealing with and damaged by that past when it comes to learning how to be accountable, how to tell the truth about itself as well as its neighbors. Is Ukraine not in a position to no, do that? No, 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 I'm suggesting much worse than that. I'm suggesting that um, uh, Ukraine is neighboring the country, uh, which is ruled actually by the successor of the same KGB, that has been responsible for all these techniques of the ideological subversion, mm. and that the same techniques that has been in use in the so-called Cold War times are still in usage, and uh, but, but there you, are... You mean in Russia? You, no, I mean in, I mean in Ukraine, I mean in Great Britain, I mean in Europe, all over Europe. I but think that's what I mean by saying that we are all, in a way, you know, victimized by the uh, Russian story. Okay, to make myself perfectly clear, I don't want to take all the time on this panel, uh, but I think it's an important point to be made. Uh, like for some 10 years or more, uh, and I do have, you know, this prospect of uh, how Ukraine has been perceived in the West uh, for the past 20 years, so to speak. Uh, like when you talk to, I'm translated for a Ukrainian in a reasonably um, handsome amount of countries, and I go to the presentations and I talk to people and to the press. Uh, and it's always been like, oh yeah, we know everything about Ukraine, it's a split country. Oh, it's a split country, yeah, half of it is pro-West and half of it is pro-Russian, and uh, you, you know this cliché, it's very popular. You, may, you might have known anything else about Ukraine, but you definitely knew that this is a split country. Mm. So this has been actually a long information stage preparing uh, for the current war, 
creating this mental picture of Ukraine as a non-existent country, split country, and no one, in fact, was asking, uh, when buying this cliché, was asking one, oneself, okay, if, uh, if half of Ukraine is pro-Western and half of it is pro-Russian, where is Ukraine itself? Uh, so this is this is a kind of this um, you know very um, very cunning propaganda tricks and there are many of them and uh, the interesting thing which passed unnoticed uh, that uh, last year uh, in March 2014 uh, in the same days. Uh, when the attention of the world had been focused on the annexation of Crimea, in the days of this Crimean fake referendum, uh, there was another momentous thing that happened in Russia. Um, that is, Russian government has issued a law prolonging the term of secrecy for the documents of uh, TK, NKVD, KGB mm. from 1918 to 1991. And I think it's uh, the best proof that the same techniques are still in usage. And yes, right. they are. We are all subjected to the information war which had been lasting for the past 20 years. Okay. Well, you put that into a very clear context, the context of, of the Soviet legacy. Yes. And, and yes, because there is this succession. I understand. And as you point out, the guy in the Kremlin today is with long experience of the KGB. That's where he comes from. It's where his mind was formed. I understand that. But now I'm going to turn to Peter uh, Pomerantsov and ask you, Peter, with your experience inside the Russian media, whether you feel able to give me... Uh, a clear answer to this question, which, you know, we put in our program as who in this region right now is confronting their history and who is spreading propaganda? Oksana's answer seems to be that because of the Soviet legacy, it's very hard to actually see that there isn't propaganda coming from many different places. But what, what's your answer to the question? Well, I mean, the propagandists are spreading the propaganda. But th there's... Um, uh, what's really unique about this region um, even though maybe unique is the wrong word, what we're seeing concentrated in this region, but it's actually um, an issue throughout the world, is um, I know back in the 20th century, you had a very, very clear idea about um, what pro we thought propaganda was and what we thought was the battle for truth and the battle of ideas. It was about getting the truth through the Iron Curtain uh, or for the Soviets getting it through to the West. And so I recently worked on an on a EU-related project in the Baltics to look at how people were, Russian-speaking communities in the Baltics were affected by Russian media. They don't have the problem of the 20th century where they don't have enough information. Most of them are bilingual or trilingual, it's Russian, Estonian, English. And they have the internet. They've so. got the BBC, they've got Al Jazeera, they've got Russian stuff, Estonian stuff. Yeah. They've got the internet, they've got radio. Actually, instead of... A lack of information, they almost have too much. Mm. And in that environment, their reaction, this was focus groups that we conducted, is we don't believe anyone. You know, when the realities are so different, when the BBC is saying, you know, Ukraine just had a democratic revolution and the Russians are saying fascists have taken over, the reaction is actually not to believe anyone, but they said, we go with the Russians because they're more emotional. <laughs> and the stories they tell are more exciting. And there was a lovely line, they're more objective because it's more like the cinema. Um, so so be, be clear with me, because you know the Russian media pretty well. When we watch Russia Today today, and we see things on Russia Today, which to our Western eyes look like, frankly, pretty crude propaganda, stories uh, about you know, the nature of the war, which tell us that absolutely not one single Russian member of military security forces has been involved, that the Ukrainian side is simply dominated by neo-Nazis and fascists and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. It sounds to us incredibly crude. What, what is the purpose of it? Is it to be credible or is there something else going on? 
No, no, no. The, the point is, and this is the essence of disinformazione, and always has been, just to muddy the waters, sow confusion. So people are like, well, I don't really know what's going on. Ukraine's far away. Why should I care? Just break down, muddy the waters, slow everything down. But with the Russian speakers, we're talking about this region, because we can go back to Russia's strategy in the West. So people in the Baltics would say, we don't believe anyone, but we, move, we lean towards the Russians because they have more emotional stories. And the Russian Deputy Minister for Communications, the Deputy Press Minister, openly says, yeah, we do disinformation, doesn't matter. Our, our ratings are really high. It's a great show. And basically, a, in this research that we did in this Brussels project, there's a lovely quote from a, a Russian academic uh, at one of the top universities who sort of said, the point of Russian propaganda is they've destroyed any border that was remaining. And it was already pretty damn shaky after several you know, Iraq wars, but uh, completely destroyed the border between facts and fiction. And that's done openly, that's proclaimed. There's no, the logic is there is no truth out there, you'll never find it out, but go with us because our emotional content is more vital. Deeply cynical. Cynical but effective, you're saying. Well, the funny thing is that, that cynicism opens the gates towards sort of, it breaks down critical thinking, and the other end of cynicism is actually something quite medieval and emotional, a world of myths and storytelling. Yeah. Because once you don't believe in facts, then you're just left with that. Right. So, Bernard, you're an outsider to this, but you spend your time, well, some of your time, writing and thinking about the nature of dictatorships and autocracy and authoritarianism, when you look at this region in terms of the information flow of the way people write their histories and present their news and current affairs, what do you see happening? What is absolutely sure is that in any conflict, in any battle, the question of the truth and of the lies is part of the battlefield. This is since uh, the world is world, since the Greeks, since uh, Thucydides in the ancient Greece, you don't have any war without the question of the truth being involved and without a conflict of narratives. This is the case now between Ukraine and Russia. I, I've, got to, I've got to interrupt you for a second because you, you're a philosopher and I just want to ask you the most ignorant and basic philosophical question. Do you as a philosopher operate on the principle that there is a truth out there to be found? Absolutely. I believe that there is a truth and that there is a referee always in any situation from the ancient times till today you have a referee who is the judge of what is propaganda and what is truth. In this case you are speaking since a moment. Putin versus Ukraine. Mm. The referee is the public opinion in the West. I will take three brief examples. Example number one, the idea that the population of the east of Ukraine are all in favor of Russia and are ready to embrace Putin. Journalists went there. I was one of them. I was with President Poroshenko in Kramatorsk a few days before uh, the fall of uh, um, Debaltsevo. A few days before the fall of Debaltsevo, I was in Kramatorsk. I, I witnessed the reality. I saw that the people of Kramatorsk welcomed Petro Poroshenko as a blessing, as their president. I did not hear during these 20 hours any sign of an anti-Ukrainian trend. I met a lot of people, and I wrote that, and I told it on American TV, on Charlie Rose, I told it in France, I saw through Ukrainian patriots. So, but, but with, with, you know, with foreign respect, witnesses, you're, you're like me, you're a guy who goes to a place for 20 hours, you don't speak the language, you travel in the president's motorcade, you see no, a couple of friendly I, I villages, remained, and you think you know the story. No, no, no. I went with the president, and I remained without the president. And I did my job of witness. And I think, and I, I'm not the only one to have said that, that there is a legend, a myth of a whole east of Ukraine being already uh, in Russia. Right, so Other examples in the past. So you're, you're prepared to say, in your opinion, with your field work, the objective truth 
is that not all residents of East Ukraine exactly. are pro-Russian. Absolutely. All right, give me one more example then of what you think one is... More, one more example. There was a big fight last year on the question of, since, not last year, since five years, on, between the narrative in Ukraine, narrative in Russia, about the question of Holodomor. You know that there, have, there has been a huge activity of Russian diplomats, of Russian journalists, of Russian ambassadors to the United Nations to try to sell a version of the Holodomor, to say that the count is not five million but is less, to say that the target was not the Ukrainian people but the whole of Soviet Union, and to say that there was not a plan of starvation. This was the narrative of uh, Russia. All over the world, they, they, there were some people trying to impose this narrative. On the other side, you had the narrative of Ukraine who said that there was at least five million dead, that Ukraine was targeted as such, and that there was a plan by Stalin to punish and to commit a genocide. The West, you have a lot of scholars who did the job. I could quote you books uh, in America, in Europe, who checked the information, who did the academic fact-checking of this battle. And the, the, the truth is that Holodomor was a genocide and that the narrative of Ukraine is closer to the truth than the narrative of Putin. And another example, for, which was very important last year, which was the question of the liberation of Auschwitz. You remember this fight between the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland and the President of the Duma in Moscow about the question to know if Auschwitz was liberated by whom? It was liberated by Le, le Premier Front Ukrainian, the first, the first uh, Ukrainian army. The Russians said that it was named Ukrainian army, not because it was composed of Ukrainians, but because the main battlefield was Ukraine. And there was again the referee, which is the Western academics, the Western historians, went but through the question and they discovered what? And this is now in archives, that the Premier Front, the Premier Corps d'Armée Ukrainian was composed half of it of Ukrainians, which means that there was an overproportion of Ukrainians. Number two, that the first battalion who entered in Auschwitz was led by an Ukrainian officer called right. Mr. Shapiro. Enough, enough detail. I, no, I mean, no, no, no I, I know the detail is important, but you've uh, made three in important case, case studies. Details are crucial. Yeah, but listen, I know they are, and you've, there are three case studies where you say that the evidence is clear that the truth was on one side and not on the other. But interestingly, you say that the referee, the judge and the jury, lies in the West. And I can almost hear in, in my head the people in Moscow saying, well, that is just so typical. Who says that the judge, the referee, can sit in London or Paris or Brussels? I mean, that, that to Russians is part of the problem. It's the arrogance of Western values being imposed on them when they do not accept them. I'm sure that there is also some evaluations of this question in India, in Brazil. You have also scholars in this part of the world who uh, uh, also tried to watch what was the reality of Holodomor. I know them less, but there exists also. The problem of Moscow is not that they refuse a Western referee. It is that they don't believe in truth. They don't believe, they believe that truth is um, all right. An opposition of equal propaganda. This is their problem. Okay, yeah, I understand your point. Oksana, then, if, if you, I don't know whether you agree entirely with Bernard and his view of what is going on here, but if you do, to a certain extent, then in a way, what we've got is a battle of values and ideals with Ukraine, it seems, wanting to be much closer to a Western view 
of truth based upon real evidence, based upon fact-finding and truth-telling to the public. And if that's what Ukraine wants for itself, if those are the values that Ukraine feels it shares with the West, why is it that the Ukrainian media right now falls so far short of those values and ideals? Why is the media so heavily controlled by individuals who have vested interests? Why is there so little honesty and accountability in the Ukrainian media? And why is Ukraine practicing censorship? Ooh, um, do I have one hour to lecture on the subject? <laughs> we don't have an hour, but give me the, give me the three-minute version. The summary. Um, well, um, you know, um, okay, I have to get back to my initial point. You know that Ukrainian media don't really, at its current stage, don't really represent Ukrainian nation. But why? why? Why are the Ukrainian people not demanding a different... Because that's information war, Steve. That's information war on the part of Russia, which has been lasting at least for the last 15 years. Back in the 90s, uh, Ukrainian media had attempted at creating this public space for the national discussion and, uh, and all these things. A, a genuinely but free and open kind of, space. Kind of, you know, uh, post-colonial rejuvenation period that we were having in the 90s. Right. Uh, the dramatic turn uh, happened, uh, the most dramatic change had been introduced uh, on the turn of the 90s and uh, two years two and 2000. Uh, and uh, since then, actually, we get more and more Russian presence, we've been getting more and more Russian presence in Ukrainian media, more and more Russian content in Ukrainian media, more and more Russian supervisors in the major Ukrainian uh, media, uh, and uh, actually what you hear now as Russian demand of Ukraine, this federalization as the dismemberment on the administrative level, yeah, has yeah. been preceded, uh, let me finish, let me finish, that's important, uh, has, been, has been preceded with this dismemberment of the Ukrainian, in, the whole Ukrainian information domain. Like, w there is actually no single newspaper in the country which would have been um, you know, read and discussed uh, in the same day from, say, Uzhgorod to Donetsk. There are regional TV channels, there is regional press, there are different areas of value, different channels of value, and so, so on and so forth. We've been, we've met this war, we had to face this hot war, so to speak. I know, you know, as a nation which has a very little knowledge of itself because there has been a total misrepresentation of what Ukrainian society has really been engaged into and has has been really busy with for the past 15 years. My question though, and maybe I'll bring Peter in, because I know you, you think about these things, is, is why, I mean obviously Ukraine is in a very difficult place right now, economically, politically, militarily, we understand that, it's not easy for Ukraine, but why is Ukraine not more confident about embracing Bernard's v version of, of truth-telling, of, of uh, I suppose Western values when it comes to storytelling, media, news coverage. Why is there a lack of confidence in this country? Why, at the most preposterous level, does Ukraine's government think it is worth banning books that it sees as biased towards Russia, or even banning Gerard Depardieu from coming to this country? I mean, it's just ludicrous. I mean, if you're a confident country, you don't mess about with things like that because you know it, it, it can't harm you. Why is Ukraine not more confident? Um, well, actually, it's largely your fault, Stephen. <laughs> um, there was a terrible mistake made in the early 1990s when um, there was a real opportunity for the West to help nurture the foundations of 
democracy is a reality-based public discourse here. And in that moment, when it was so important to create real public broadcasters in Ukraine, in Moldova, actually throughout Eastern Europe. We have a crisis throughout Eastern Europe where media is owned right. by vested interests who don't look at it as an element of public discourse, but as mini information war. I mean, the TV channels here were used for one oligarch to throw disinformation at another oligarch. Um, very similar to Russia, but Russia centralized that into um, you know, an international relations weapon. Yeah. But it's the same traditions, and it was a terrible failure of the West uh, when it had a real moment when it could do something to nurture democracy. And someone had this... But you didn't... No, but hang on. That, I mean, that's a bit like so many different forms of, of blaming the, the, the Westerner, the colonialist, the imperialist. I mean, in the end, th this change has to come from within. I mean, why aren't there more Ukrainians who can see what you guys all can see, which is that playing Russia at its own game of propaganda, cynical manipulation, information wars isn't the way to a, a healthy, accountable society. But where would it come from, Stephen? I mean, in the Soviet Union, and Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, there was no idea of media as the fourth estate, as the responsible public discourse. That's something that we're nurtured with in Britain, but that's unique. Uh, quite the opposite. The instinct here was always for a journalism in the Soviet tradition, where the journalist is a propagandist by definition. The idea that the state would nurture an opposition to itself in the media is sort of surreal. Is, uh, it, is it still surreal in this country today? There are bits, as Aksana keeps on making this very powerful point, the media don't represent, it's not a bottom-up media, it doesn't represent the people, it represents vested interests. And you do see lots and lots and lots of initiatives, bottom-up initiatives. I'll mention one. I was just in Odessa. Uh, I'll try to be very brief. I was in Odessa, which is a city which has 48 TV channels, all owned by vested interests, all giving their own narrative. Like a, a little mini kind of a a dramatization of what the country is going through. And they had this terrible fire on May the 2nd when 40 pro-Russian yeah. people died. The police wouldn't do anything because they were involved in it in their own devious ways. So a bunch of civic actors, journalists, both pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainian, got together and created a public investigation, which at least gave the journalistic community a sense of what were the facts. And those kind of little civic spurts towards the truth, right. they do happen in a moment of crisis. But um, uh, I think there's a huge role to be played now in building up a true public broadcasting here. And it's not just here, it's actually a, a problem throughout Eastern Europe. No, that's a, a point well made. And this, the US. This is a, a, a regional issue, and, and frankly it goes beyond this region too, but it is so important right now for Ukraine, it seems to me, to get to a place where it, it, it is developing uh, a more challenging, a more accountable media space. Um, we have a few minutes left, and I can see a couple of hands up, so I don't know if we've got any roving microphones, uh, but we've got a terrific panel, and uh, yes, we do. So look, we've got time for a couple of questions, so keep them brief. Go on, sir. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, three points. First... You're not allowed three points. Make, the f make your favorite point, because we're a bit short of time. This will be my three favorite points. <laughs> the first, uh, don't use the word of propaganda uh, because there is no communist time. There is no propaganda. Propaganda was during communist time. Second, think about the substance. What kind of message can be delivered by the people who have a good message, good news? And the last one, if I follow uh, the, the, the panel, excluding uh, honorable uh, chairperson, uh, you are speaking like uh, people from the 20th century. Believe me, you are in the 21st century. There is a social media. You have a lot of, a lot of things to do without any control. The question is, do you want to do that as a Ukraine, as a state of Ukraine, or you give it up, gave it up. So that's the message. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. Comment on that? Yes, you may. Um, I think um, that's a very interesting point. Uh, what century are we in? And uh, what is really at stake in this war? Um, I'm deeply convinced about that, and I'm deadly serious. 
uh, is not actually whether Ukraine will be passed again uh, into the Russian zone of influence or not nor even whether Kremlin will succeed in uh, dividing, splitting and dismembering the European Union the way it has been working on dividing, splitting and parting Ukraine. It's not about that. It's about answering the crucial question for our entire civilization, for the 21st century and maybe for the centuries to come. You know, writers like speak in big words. Which is, to what extent human society can be manageable and manipulated? Are we ready to leave our children and grandchildren living in the neo-Orwellian world. Because that's precisely what we deal with in this war. I mean, we, Ukraine, we, the West, that is also disoriented, and what we see, you know, served to us is this grand, huge Potomkin village created by this wonderful synthesis of Lubyanka and Hollywood that learned to serve good stories, creating a totally fictional world and imposing it upon you as information. And that's really a new approach to the reality. It's synthesis of Orwell and Huxley. Uh, so, we've been talking about the Im imminent threats of the 21st century. But you don't, uh, Bernard, I'd like you to think about this. Do you think that the access to social media, the, the way in which information flows... Oh, are, I, can lecture, on, I, I can lecture for hours how social media are now being controlled on a very subtle level. Right, because the, the, the easy assumption is that social media is less top-down and is more bottom-up, so that it's harder to impose control. But is that the way you see it, or do you think we've misread the potentiality of social media and the Internet? Number one, I would like to reply to this gentleman that to build a proper public space is always a very long, very difficult task and probably unfinishable anywhere, not only in Ukraine, but also in countries which are supposed to be much more mature in terms of democratic values. So it's always a big thing. And even in France, for example, you have people who believe that the press is not as free speaking as it should, etc., etc. Number one. Number two, press in Ukraine is not so bad, or at least I would say that seeing from where it comes, from the Soviet times, from the communism and so on, the process, the progress is rather quick. And number three, there is the social networks. And the social networks can be, it's very hard to reply, can be the worst and can be the best. It is very often the vehicle of the worst bullshits and the worst conspiracy theories, and it is the fatherland, the nest of all the conspiracy theories, which are the enemies of the truth. But the social networks are also the antidote the counter poison to that. It is both. And there is a battle in the 21st century, which I know a little also, between the two, between the poison and the counter poison. And you have some moments in history where the counter poison wins on the poison. For example, the time of the Maidan. I was here in Kiev rather often during the Maidan. You had a press which was expert in propaganda, which was very often in the hands of Yanukovych, and it repeated on and on lies. And you had grassroots information 
coming from the Maidan, coming from committees of citizens of the Maidan, which was the real food of the international press, of the BBC, of the American channels, and so on. And in this circumstance, the social networks, the social medias played the good role. And for example, the question which was, if uh, the Maidan was hijacked or not by Nazis, by anti-Semites, and so on. There was this in the Russian narrative. And you had this in some of the narratives of the Ukraine of this time, of old Ukraine. This idea was killed, more or less, but was killed by the social medias, by the grassroots informations coming from those who were holding the stage and expressing for, from there. Okay, thank you for that, Bernard. Uh, we've got time for one more question at least, so you, sir, you go for it. Yes, sir, good evening. Uh, Andy Hunter, the American Chamber of Commerce in Ukraine. Um, I would like to talk about the consequences of the propaganda, especially in terms of the consequences for the uh, investment community and business. What we see that many of our uh, member companies, the companies investing in Ukraine, is what messages they have to send back home to their uh, uh, corporates back in the US or across Europe is when they mention Ukraine. Um, some uh, countries, for example, in Asia, they actually ban their employees from traveling to Ukraine because of the perception. I mean, we have this distorted perception. So my, my, my question to the panel is, you know, this distorted perception, how, how do you fix it? I think uh, Peter's book is an excellent book. I think it just highlights the problem. It diagnoses the, the illness. But what, what is the remedy? How do you fix this problem of especially communicating to investors, to, to the big corporates, about what the reality in Ukraine is today? Thank you. All right. Well, Peter, you got an accolade for your book, so now you come up with a solution. Well, I mean, in the case of Ukraine, the problem goes much deeper because Ukraine hasn't really been able to communicate its identity in the world. Um, it was very easy for the Russians to go, it's full of fascists. Um, as you remember, there was a terrible BBC documentary about the risk of uh, right-wing violence during 2012 European Championships, uh, which was really just feeding you know, this, this, this bizarre image of uh, Ukraine as a, a, a bastion of the far, far right, which the, it's present, but much less than lots of countries in Europe. Um, so because Ukraine hasn't been able to communicate itself internationally, Russia and whoever else can just throw images onto it. The answer is for Ukraine to start expressing itself much more coherently and uh, much more effectively. But your message today, because we're going to have to wrap this conversation in a moment, is that if we're buying the concept of an information war and we see that there is a great deal of cynicism about the way in which information is used, that right now uh, Moscow is a far more effective player than any other player on the field. Oh, well, you know, it's very, very good at propaganda because it can centralize it. Uh, the Kremlin has a natural gift towards theater, always has done. Um, but it's, propaganda can only be as good as its overall strategy. Uh, at the end of the day, propaganda is just a handmaiden's politics. We shouldn't get carried away about sort of like, you know, these uh, the huge billows of propaganda. Your propaganda is only as good as your politics. And I'm not entirely sure the Kremlin's politics are all that good. Right. Well, uh, I, I'm sure many in the room would share that feeling. Uh, Oksana, a final thought from you. I mean, you've repeatedly wanted to put this in the context of, of the history of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the power and reach of, of that communist idea of what information and storytelling is all about and how it can be manipulated and used and the long-lasting effects of that. Are you um, feeling quite bleak, quite pessimistic about the legacy that has been left behind in Ukraine and the difficulty of Ukraine to reach a different place when it comes to storytelling, history telling, and truth telling. Uh, I'm deeply pessimistic about the fate of humanity, Steve. Are you? Yeah. Well, that's not a, just um, about yeah. Of course, you know my country is part of it. Uh, especially the people this, in this room. <laughs> 
But as I said, we are all now in the same boat, we are, and we are hardly aware of the scale of the threat. Mm. And, uh, and yes, it is writer's business, you know, to scream like, Cassandra, wake up, Troy, wake up, Troy. Yeah, I mean, I can't, I can't be anything else but that. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, it has just come to my mind um, an interesting example. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I've been interviewed uh, by a Hungarian journalist, a young woman, most of whose conscious life was spent in the EU. And uh, I've been explaining her all this business about what, uh, what is this distorted picture of Ukraine, like Ukraine does not speak speaking ukraine not speaking for itself and have not speaking for itself for 20 years while russia has been telling this made up uh, fake ukrainian story to the world uh, instead of ukraine uh, and yes, that's colonial, post-colonial, whatever. I mean, British won't understand that anyway, so you just take it for granted. Uh, and uh, she has been listening very attentively, and then her question was like, well, but media are manipulating with their audience everywhere. Media are manipulative by definition. And this has been precisely this argument that I remember from the techniques of the Soviet counter-propaganda, you know, to even uh, right. the sins, to even the faults and blah, blah, blah. And here is this lady in her 20s. And I've been, uh, you know, immediate in my reaction. And I said, well, you know, that is a difference whether you manipulate your audience to make them to buy a new brand of shampoo or whether you manipulate your audience to make them to go to another country to kill the people there for a made-up reason. And I think this is the drawing line. What kind of feelings, uh, mass feelings, are uh, used for manipulating, if it is um, well, natural human desire to have a better life, it's one thing. If it is the aggression, jealousy, hatred that is getting mobilized, uh, then this is the technology of the induced madness. And we all live and are subjected in a way to the results, you know, of this grand technology of the induced madness, which in case of Russia has been four generations long and never recognized in that quality. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna give the last word to you, Bernard. Make it short if you possibly can, but I'm intrigued by your career because you spend a lot of time thinking big thoughts, philosophical thoughts, but then you... That's what I'm paid for. Well, you and him. But w what he does from time to time is he gets off his backside in Paris and goes to war zones and he goes to places of great conflict and human suffering and you try and report. You try and just say what is happening in front of you. Do you have as much faith as you ever had in the importance of that, of bearing witness, of truth-telling? Of course, I have more and more faith in that because I have more and more the feeling that those who make war do it with weapons and with narratives. Uh, any conflict in the world, and this one does not make exception, you have armored tanks, you have rocket launchers, you have all sorts of weaponry, and you have narratives, words, and so on. So to be a witness, to try to say the truth, is more crucial than at any time of the recent history. Yes, of course, I believe that more than ever. And as I said, uh, I, as President uh, Perez said uh, previously, uh, you, you, be, uh, you, begin, uh, you become old only when you have more achievements 
than dreams, and you remain dreams when you have more, uh, you remain young when you have more dreams than achievements. My dream is to continue to be a witness as much as I can. And indeed remain young as well. <laughs> well, that's a great way to end. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have followed my instructions and eaten quietly, at least pretty quietly. And I thank you for that. And if you would, just give all three of my panelists a very, very warm thank you for a terrific discussion. Thank you very much indeed, panelists. And um, let me just say, continue to enjoy dinner. There is going to be quite a spectacular link with the United States before too long. It'll be an expression of what happens when democracy pushes its outer limits, if you know what I mean. So get ready. Get ready for an entertaining example of American democracy and democratic discussion. I'll leave you with that thought and enjoy your dinner.